25 minutes. So your question was, are we tilling the strip in the pumpkins? No, so you find the strip of pumpkins. Mm -hmm. Is that strip left there in the fall when you plant the rye? So when we, when we get set up for our pumpkins, we're broadcasting the rye in the fall and then the shallow corp. And then in the spring, we're actually going through their strip till two to three times. So we go through when the rye is about uh, this tall. And then again, when the rye is this tall. And then we go through the strip again once we roller crimp it down. We've tried to strip till it once to two times, and that didn't work very well. It's too clumpy, maybe for corn or soy or another crop that's a little stronger. It'd work, but for vegetable, it was it wasn't a consistent seed bed. Jack and lantern pumpkins. I know that um, people are leaving. I just wanted to announce the winner of Foundation Seed Raffle before she leaves. Greta Moreau um, was the winner, and we saw the pictures of your sweet boy during Bob's presentation. So it's just awesome that he, you can come home with a tractor. So thank you, Foundation Seeds, for that, um, that gift. So the question is on our strip tail for running a knife or just cultures, we're running both. Um, when, after we strip till, or after we roll a crimp, sometimes we're adjusting those cultures up because they get wrapped up in rye. We're also running trash whippers on our planter. And four out of the five years, um, Eric, my husband, and I are laying under the planter with a knife, chopping rye off those trash whippers. But for some reason, we keep leaving them on every year because they're the one time that we left them on, it was really helpful. So we haven't learned our lesson there yet. We're, the brand of strip till we are running is an Orthman one tripper. Uh, we have a, a six row and a 12 row, or it's two 12 rows. I can't remember, we have two units. With your uh, interceding rye on soybeans, how, how long after your soybeans are planted are you planting your rye? We are typically spreading before we plant our soybeans. So we're spreading, broadcasting that rye. We, this year we did it 10 days before, about three, day, three, four days before planting the soybeans, and then the day we planted soybeans, we spread rye. Um, we haven't planted it after. I think the guys in Dakota did it the same day, and I got my friend and I was taking three bushel of rye, two bushel of beans, and putting in our air machine with fertilizer, bulk spreading it, getting the field ready, waiting a week, bulk spreading and then running his first harrow over it a couple of times because now he's going to have a weed flush and it's all planted at the same time. Hoping we wouldn't have as much of it. I don't know how it's going to work. If it doesn't work, it's a green manure crop. I, I, and really, and then definitely share information if you guys try stuff on that because I'm really curious as to how we can dial down the timing and working off of John's talk about how we can think of, like he showed how um, you know common ragweed kind of comes early. How do we kind of time the planting of the rye and the benefits of the rye before different weed flushes. But again, we have to wait for this until, I would say, after the best, the safest time would probably be right around the um, last frost date just to make sure those temperatures don't dip below 42. We're still not exactly sure how long they have to be below 42 for rye to fertilize. been trying to look through the literature. So if everyone, anyone has that answer too, it would be really, really useful. Which is interesting because our winter wheat as a nurse crop in our alfalfa, we've been doing it for 20 years. I've yet to see it try to head out. Really? to see never. And we plant it in alfalfa. Yeah. As soon as we get in, it might be the first week in April. Huh. I've, it, it always dies. The first cutting, it's going to be there. The second cutting, it might green up, and that's about it. starts to turn brown, and by July, it's gone. It's never, ever completed going to seed ever. Well, that's, that's interesting. So I don't know. That's winter wheat. I don't know why. It doesn't. Huh. It's been cut a couple of times, huh. but it dies. Gary, you mentioned sheet composting, and I know Gary McDonald calls it the same thing, and um, I know that uh, compost is just really energy intensive, compaction intensive, a um, lot of challenges. Is it possible that we can grow these multi 
species cocktail mixes, shred them down, and disc them in the top couple inches of soil, and uh, really make our soil unlazy, make it do the composting for us, energize, you know, the bacteria and everything that's there, instead of going through this elaborate composting process. Now, I know you have manure, and that's a completely different deal, too, but um, what's your thoughts about that? And, and for the cash croppers in the room that don't have the manure, is this a long-term viable option? And I think that, right, it, the term sheet composting came about because of cost and doing else. And we generally then took, like, those corn stalks, now we get a brown carbon, put our manure on it and grew, like, our oats or something, and shallow incorporated again with our rotavid, whatever we call it, sheet composting. Could I do it with just your cocktail mix? I got to make sure I don't have all complex carbons. But absolutely, I think you can change that. See, the soil structure is going to be fixed from the top down. I absolutely think you can work that in because, you know, you, you might... As long as you're just running shallow. In the old days when we did that, we had rotavators, and see, we were just really cutting really shallow in there. But you're right on top of that ground. You, you know, if you want to put a little more moisture in there, you might want to go a little deeper. But I, you can really rot that down in a hurry or change that into uh, – I, I just don't want to get an anaerobic. So as long as we keep it up there in the top part and keep it aerobic, I think we called it making compost. All stuff rots, and it's just it's controlled rotting without problems, I think. I think you absolutely can. How big would I let that cocktail mix get? That would be my question. What am I going to grow next? How have I got to manage it to get my accomplish what I want to accomplish? Other questions? I do have a comment on Gary. He's talking about putting oats in in the spring. We did that before our snap bean crops, and we always consistently see higher yields when we're putting our oats before our snap bean crops much higher yields putting those oats in. And it's a really nice spring cover. Um, this year we, we were able to maybe get 75% of the, our farm cover crop just because of the fall. And we know this next spring we're going to go right into those fields that haven't been cover cropped with a cover crop that will most likely be oats. Yes. So if you read my second book now, I, I tell the story of those guys from Minnesota. I talk kind of fast, and they get things all mixed up. And I said, we're tight old germans. I don't want to spend over $10 an acre. This was back a few years ago. They thought I said put on 10 bushel of oats. Well, oats is a dollar and a half a bushel. So they put 10 bushel of oats on. Talk to them. Now they're down to six bushel because the price of oats went up a little bit, and they have to use organic oats. And they said, the best practice we ever brought to our farm was putting 10 bushel loads out there in the spring in front of soybeans. Our weed control was wonderful. We had the most beautiful crop, so soybean crops we ever had. Now we use conventional loads that are down and a half a bushel. It's only $15 an acre. So they just, you know, they got me mixed up. But that's how we learn things. So, what's you said six bushels of oats ahead of soybeans? Now they're doing the six bushel oats. I think they're bulk spreading, working men are drilling. Many oats don't do well laying on top of the ground. And I, again, uh, we, over in Europe, see, I was in Holland, and the drills are three inches apart. We, we got a coon grouse, we got a 30 footer, so we, the closest we could get was six. I guess you can get a five and a half. So I, over in Europe, I like their, their small grain till. They spent all their time getting small grain equipment. We got corn and bean planters. And so I want to get as close together or check it, go the other direction. I want to get it thick like your lawn. I don't know how to do that oats thing out here, but to get that really thick, I, I think that you've got plenty of time. And like I said, you can plant it really early oats, and you'll get a pretty nice crop, get it about a foot tall, take it down, and you've got a nice cover crop in there, and I think you've done some, sucked up a lot of soluble nutrients. It seems to really make that crop better. Uh, question for Gary and Megan and Aaron Yu. Are you guys inoculating your soybeans even if they've been in the rotation when you're going into the rolled rice system? Yeah, we built our own seed treater to treat our organic beans because seed treaters are expensive. Um, we took an old uh, gravity box. We got a auger built for um, about $1,200 from Badger Plastic, and then we took my old, much to my chagrin, my old garden tractor was the power. Um, so I didn't have a garden this year. And we were able to treat all of our soybeans with inoculant. I think, I think yesterday there was conversation about do you actually need to treat your soybeans with inoculant if you've been inoculating? I don't know. Maybe we would put in a couple of acres, try it out. But, yeah, we, we inoculate our beans and, and our dry edibles. So what happened a few years ago, we took some CRP land in our country. 25 years ago, they never grew soybeans. And so we took the CRP land and we went through a rotation and the guy that works for us planted soybeans and he didn't inoculate them. I said, oh man, there's never been a soybean ever grown on this crop. 
And it's unbelievable, the nodules on those soybeans. I don't know how they got there or where they came from. You see, and I think more importantly is I would, we always inoculate just because it's something I've just been taught to do and I don't know how to quit. No, but I think there's still a value. Just like I say out here, I think what's coming in agriculture, conventional and organic, is that people talked about getting uniform stands. And I think Joel mentioned what comes up at what stage makes the best. A cluster mix. Put down your row on top the seed on planting, whether it be corn or soybeans, has been very successful in getting crops out of the ground in uniform stands. That CX1 over there is a, like a compost tea extract from Purple Cow. is worth looking into it. they got a patented process. That biological, we put our terra-fed molasses, we might put some fish, we might put some kelp in there. People are right on top of the seed. You'll get more uniform, better root development. You, I said to the guy, just like inoculating your soybeans are not going to leave your alfalfa. You're not going to do it with a helicopter spreading on top of the ground. If you're going to use a biological, right on top of the seed. And those guys in Australia do it all the time, right under drills. You only got a couple bucks to spread. It's going to be a biological on top of the seed, like a cluster mix, to protect it and get it off to a better start and get better root development. I think that's where those things belong. Now, honestly, Gary, and that's what we last year did. So we do always inoculate, same reason as Gary. I, I think there's been some research studies that have shown, like, if they actually, like, look at a genetic level, what is inocul what is causing nodules on a soybean. Many times it is native species of rhizobia, not what's being inoculated. But we, we do it. We've been taught to do it. We do it. It's inexpensive. But we were, last year we worked with Sandy Seberg to use CX1 in addition to try to stimulate the nodulation in the growth in, in, in an organic no-till rolled rye system. It was a demo plot. It wasn't our best field. It was in more northern Wisconsin. But we did see some intriguing differences that are going to, you know, it, it's enough to make us do some more replicated plots this year. So we'll be trying a combination of, of uh, inoculation with rhizobium and then using the CX1. We, we use CX1 in furrow, and we also use it in our strip till. Biological products can be really expensive per acre unless you're dribbling in just a row with your seed or you're putting it down with your strip till. Our strip till, we can layer it at four and eight inches is where we apply. And we're finding we have such a much higher cost savings with more benefits by applying it directly to our seed rows than, than broadcasting or broad spraying. Yeah. Other questions? Mark. Let me give you this to repeat since you're saying some good stuff. You can repeat that if you're saying too much. Aaron, you were at our current field day, and you said your beans are greener than, than mine at the university. The only probably difference was we blew down about 20 pounds of humic in the seed trench. Humic has a whole bunch of minerals, but it also has molly, which is required for rhizobium, not so much the plant. So I'm not sure it's the molly, I'm not sure what it is, but it's candy for biological activity. And we did it at Matt's farm with and without, and you can't believe the difference in the pictures. You know, uh, we're not sure if it translated to yield, but I know there's more nitrogen going forward in falling crops. Because I think you're getting it out of the ground. That's been our struggle with it. We quit the rolling because we couldn't make it successful. It doesn't mean it can't be, it just wasn't for us. But I think we could have, we were, the slow start to get going. I think that's where some focus has to be put. How do we get out of the ground and going faster? And I think that I think that's absolutely right. Whether it's humic or whatever it is. Thank you.